Okay, thank you, Victoria. Um, my voice is really going fast, so <laughs> bear with me. I'm going to rely on the microphone here, um, but I'm feeling feeling like I can get through this half-hour talk. Um, so I spoke earlier today about the role of keto adaptation in reversing diabetes and counteracting insulin resistance, which uh, you know has huge implications for our diabetes epidemic. And I've always, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, I've been studying ketogenic diets. I've always thought there may be a role for athletes in enhancing performance, but I have to admit, it's been quite shocking uh, the last several years how many athletes have converted to low carb and not just being able to perform exercise, but to really excel at exercise. So the uh, talk um, today, I, I really want to focus on some of the evidence that's suggesting keto adaptation is not only relevant for reversing diabetes, and of course you've learned about many other applications on the clinical side, mm -hmm at the conference, including cancer and maybe Alzheimer's and other diseases, but at the complete other end of the spectrum, the same diet may actually help perform optimally. That's pretty, pretty neat, I think. So some of the evidence that this works uh, is really coming from athletes that are out on the front lines competing. Uh, there are many, many ultra-endurance athletes who are setting course records or national records Here's just a handful, and I think there's, there's a growing list of athletes that are setting their own PRs, even into middle age, um, and having really life-changing, transformative experiences when they're keto-adapted. So this is fascinating. It's not science, right? This, these are all N1 experiments, but when you have now dozens and hundreds, probably, of N1 experiments all showing very positive effects, it's hard to ignore. So, uh, you know, we're at a point now where you have some really good books out there talking about the role of keto adaptation and low-carb diets for athletes. And you've got some mainstream athletes now. I mean, the ultra-endurance world is still a pretty small group of people that doesn't get a lot of publicity, but you've got the top two Tour de France winners now coming out acknowledging they are low-carb athletes. That's pretty pretty amazing. You've got team sports now embracing this. Uh, I'm f fortunate to have a professional soccer team right in my backyard that uh, has totally um, embraced low carb nutrition and keto adaptation to manage um, the majority of their players. So the Columbus crew, I think, have been doing this for about three years now. And they're totally committed to, to this as a, not just a diet to enhance their performance, but to enhance their health of their players. And there's other teams too, the All Blacks are probably the more um, common and most uh, prevalent team that's been out there and promoting low sugar and low carb diets as being uh, a big, big reason for their success. So soccer, rugby, a lot of other team sports too. There's just a lot of this anecdotal evidence that's accumulating in testimonials and we're still trying to sort through some of the science uh, and, and how this works. And uh, you've probably seen this if, if you were at my talk earlier, but a lot of the adaptations that are associated with low carbohydrate ketogenic diets are very relevant to enhancing performance, and especially the ketones in terms of maybe enhancing resiliency and recovery because we know they're anti-inflammatory and reduce oxidative stress, and that's a big part of recovery but still a lot of underlying physiology to work out here. But on the surface, the, the metabolic adaptations are really the most prominent and, and play a big role. And when you're keto adapted, uh, you become very proficient at burning fat. And so, you know, you see fatty acids become the preferred fuel for skeletal muscle. Uh, ketones are the preferred fuel for the brain. And the body performs quite well with very little incoming glucose and carbohydrate. And it's amazing that we have this metabolic pathway to not just you know, walk and, and, and perform exercise, but to really have a, a, a very robust ability to perform exercise uh, in the face of very little carbohydrate. So just some evidence that keto adaptation in humans accelerates fat oxidation 
you have the classic study by Steve Finney where he showed four weeks of keto adaptation in elite cyclists resulted in some pretty astonishing rates of fat oxidation uh, on the order of about you know, 1.5 grams per hour, and that turns out to be here 90 grams of fat per hour, rather, versus 1.5 grams per minute. Um, and the highest athlete in that, in that cohort had close to two grams of fat oxidized per minute, and I think we have uh, some folks in the audience here who have even recorded values higher than that. Um, and prior to that, the highest recorded values in the literature were we're about one gram per minute or 60 grams of fat oxidized per hour. So clearly we've underestimated how much fat humans can burn. So today I wanna talk to you a bit about our FASTER study that we published one paper from. I think many of you have heard about this cohort. I wanna go through that quickly and focus on some new data that we've analyzed from that study that's unpublished and talk about a, a, a prospective study that we're conducting now um, looking at keto adaptation and performance. So this FASTER study, it was really a simple idea to compare a group of elite ultra-endurance athletes consuming either a high carbohydrate or a very low carbohydrate diet, cross-sectional study. Uh, and we were quite um, taken back with how m many athletes were willing to come to our lab. We had to kind of shut it down with 20 people that we flew from all over the country and all over the world to come to our lab and, and go through a battery of tests. And I'll just emphasize that these are all very high level athletes and they're, the two groups are actually very well matched on age and competition um, status, uh, even VO2 max. So the same you know, aerobic capacity. The main difference was their diet. So you're always limited in a cross-sectional study of knowing what's just due to you know, selection bias versus actual adaptations to, to a, a diet in this case. But here we have you know, two very well-matched groups, so I think you can attribute any differences most likely to their diet, which was very different. So we ran them through a, a, a battery of tests over two and a half days, um, included muscle biopsies, and fat biopsies and um, you know, running on a treadmill for three hours. And the main finding that we published in Metabolism last year was that their peak fat oxidation was up in that range that Finney had showed back in the mid 80s, that the peak fat oxidation was over twofold higher in the keto adapted athletes. And now these high carb athletes are very well trained and training in accelerates fat oxidation. So these are very good fat burners in the high carb group. So the keto adapted athletes just destroy that, that mean value. And actually every single person that's keto adapted is higher than the, the highest fat burner in the high carb group. And that ability to burn fat manifests over the entire exercise intensity spectrum. So uh, you are actually able to burn fat at higher exercise intensities. Um, so the peak fat burning occurs somewhere around 75 in some of these athletes, 80% of VO2 max, where in the high carb athletes, it, and other studies confirm this, it occurs around 50, 55, maybe 60% VO2 max. So just in incredible amount of adaptations to be able to mobilize and utilize fat for fuel when you're in the keto adapted state. And that occurs even at submaximal and, and, and higher exercise intensities. When you run for three hours, which is not too challenging for these athletes, they're ultra athletes, they run 100 miles, sometimes longer. Uh, you can see they do that while burning almost all fat. The at typical response is on the left, where you burn half carbs, half fat, and eventually these athletes run out of glycogen, and they're pretty near fatigue then, unless they're really aggressive in ingesting carbohydrate and sugars. So you can see, such, you know, this is just a pretty easy to understand advantage. If you're a really good fat burner, you can access your adipose tissue. You've got a, a much bigger fuel tank you can tap into and not have to worry about in-race calories as much as you do if you're dependent on carbs. Uh, ketones are higher throughout exercise. This is a three hour run on the treadmill uh, and into recovery. Glycerol is a pretty good indicator of fat breakdown in adipose tissue. So enhanced lipolysis 
not unexpected. The keto adapted athletes are breaking down fat at a much higher rate than the high carb athletes. And so fatty acid delivery to muscle is certainly one substrate that's contributing to the higher fat oxidation. And, and this was really surprising that despite the greater fat oxidation and very little carbohydrate intake, these keto adapted athletes are maintaining their glycogen stores. And so we, you know, we, we were taken back by this. It was completely unexpected. Not only do they have normal glycogen levels at rest, that they actually break down glycogen during exercise and resynthesize glycogen over two hours of recovery at the exact same rate that the high carb athletes do. Clearly for different reasons. And uh, we don't know exactly what's happening here, but there are definitely um, reasonable or, and, and hypothetical reasons you would break down glycogen even if you're not doing so for ATP generation. So sort of non-oxidative reasons why you would break down glycogen to glucose to maybe provide a, a source of uh, glucose for the pentose phosphate pathway or a source of oxaloacetate to help the Krebs cycle take in all those fatty acids. Um, so uh, we think that's going on, but at any rate, regardless of the reason why, there's this unexpected and quite remarkable adaptation in glycogen metabolism in the face of very little carbohydrate intake. Uh, we also um, did some advanced lipoprotein assessment in the faster subjects and from that you can determine a insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity score and these guys were almost off the charts in terms of their insulin sensitivity. Uh, they're down in the less than, you know, they're around the one percentile of insulin sensitivity based on this index. And the high carb group is insulin sensitive as well. Their values fall around 25 percentile of insulin sensitivity, but uh, clearly they're, they're very insulin sensitive based on this measure anyway. And I showed this earlier, but if you weren't at my talk, uh, we did a metabolomic analysis of skeletal muscle, and we actually did this resting immediately post-exercise and two hours post-exercise. And of 378 known metabolites that were quantified using this uh, metabolomic analysis, 112 were significantly different between ketogenic and uh, carb, uh, high carb athletes. And these all um, focused around metabolic pathways, primarily fatty acid metabolism. So you can see the top metabolites that were different on the, in the table on the bottom right. And these are all related to car carnitine derivatives and beta hydroxybutyrate was higher. So it just shows you uh, how robust the metabolic adaptations are when you're keto adapted, that you're having a dramatic impact on the metabolome within skeletal muscle. And there's also levels occurring at, at uh, the gene expression level. So we did a whole transcriptome analysis where we looked at over 25,000 genes and, and their level of expression. And there's definitely a set of genes that are upregulated in the keto adapted state constitutively. And a lot of these are related to metabolism and mitochondria. And here's three of the top genes, um, all related to ketog ketogenesis. Um, this is HG, um, HMG. CS2 is the gene that codes for the first enzyme in ketogenesis, and HADHA is the gene that codes for trifunctional protein and beta oxidation. And uh, protein phosphatase 1 is a regulatory uh, factor in glycogen metabolism. So all these make a heck of a lot of sense, and the fact they came out on top when there's 25,000 genes competing to be different. Um, you know, tells me there, this is more than just voodoo, uh, even though the technology is almost hard to grasp that you can quantify 25,000 genes in one sample. But the technology is pretty amazing. There's a bunch of other genes too, I won't go into all of those, but we're working on that paper. Uh, there's some genes in histone metabolism that were different, which is really interesting given the emerging role of beta-hydroxybutyrate as a HDAC inhibitor. Uh, really e emphasizing the epigenetic effects of keto, the keto-adapted um, 
phenotype. We also looked at fatty acid composition of skeletal muscle and found, and this is very preliminary, but um, our initial look at this data that just came in is that if we extract the phospholipids out of this, the muscle, uh, there's actually fewer saturated fatty acids, in particular palmitic acid, 16-O, and there's higher unsaturated fatty acids, in particular EPA, DHA, and arachidonic acid. And this is, you know, this lower saturated fat is despite the fact these guys are eating three, four times the amount of saturated fat. Yet, and, and saturated fat and phospholipids and cholesterol ester are highly associated with risk for diabetes and heart disease. So we aren't what we eat. These guys are eating a lot of saturated fat, but they're converting it to CO2 and water. And we looked at the triglyceride fraction too. So this is more the dynamic pool within muscle that's being used as fuel. And we actually see an increase in saturated fat in that fraction, but there's no evidence that that confers any risk. That's just the preferred fuel for muscle. So it's going up in particular in uh, C14, C18, and there's a decrease in palmitoleic acid, 16-1, which is something very consistent we've seen across studies over the last um, decade that indicates less de novo lipogenesis. Uh, and then We've done some additional analysis. Um, my graduate student, Parker Hyde, who uh, has a poster this evening, uh, and some of my other doctoral students uh, did several um, anabolic hormone analyses. And the, I'd encourage you to see that poster, first of all, to, to, to look at some of the other hormones we looked at. But the cliff notes is that the anabolic hormone response is retained in these uh, keto-adapted athletes, and, and there does seem to be some evidence of a higher growth hormone response, uh, especially at baseline. And so um, we're not exactly sure, you know, how to interpret that, what that means, but um, you can see the individual data here, a lot of variability, but the mean response is over twofold higher at baseline. And then another one of my doctoral students, Vin Miller, um, has an interest in mitochondrial adaptations and oxidative stress. And so we looked at a couple circulating oxidative stress markers. And this is really interesting and a bit of a head scratcher too. Uh, he has a poster this evening, so please stop by and talk to Vin. He will have some additional interpretation and explanation for these data. But we actually see a higher oxidized guanine species. And this is the exercise induced response we're looking at here. But it's transient, and it does come back down to um, levels similar to high-carb athletes by two hours post-exercise. But protein carbonyls are, are lower um, post-exercise. And myoglobin, which is more of an indicator of muscle disruption to the membrane or muscle damage, is actually higher too. And I guess the, the, the working hypothesis or theory here is that there may be a hormetic effect of keto adaptation where you actually see an initial increase in ROS um, to induce positive adaptations to, to the free radicals. Uh, because constitutively, we know from other studies that that oxidative stress is reduced. So this may even tie into some of the evidence in cancer. I know that, that uh, there's some bit of a conundrum how ROS is playing a role in radiation therapy and how keto adaptation may be overlaying on top of that. But uh, two of the athletes in our FASTER study that were in the high carb group have been in communication with us and they've switched to low carb. And you know, I'll just let you read quickly through this, but both of these athletes have had transformative experiences after switching to a low carb diet where they've set records and PRs in 100 mile races after switching. So there's clearly a, at least a subgroup, if not a, a, you know, a large cohort of people who do quite well uh, on a ketogenic diet. And we've also looked at ketogenic diets and resistance training. One of the biggest um, effects is in body composition, where you see pretty dramatic improvements in percent body fat. Uh, so 12 weeks of training and keto adaptation reduced body fat by over 5%. So, uh, you know, right now we're, we're interested in kind of going from the cross-sectional work to the actual prospective studies. And so we have an ongoing study now looking at um, how keto adaptation affects performance 
with a high military relevance because you think about soldiers, in particular special operations soldiers, the stressors that they're dealing with and coping with, trying to cope with, uh, and needing to perform both physically and cognitively, uh, it ex exceeds you know, many demands that athletes have. So that's a big area of interest in, in, in our lab right now is understanding the relevance of keto adaptations for enhancing warfighter performance. So we have an ongoing 12-week study uh, that we call the TANK study. It's tactical athletes and nutritional ketosis. And I'll, I'll just walk you through our design. We don't have a lot of data to share right now. But uh, this is a, a collaboration with the ROTC Army cadets. We have um, full support, actually. Sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Bunyak there and Major Enox and Master Sergeant uh, Shipman, who I think a couple of them are actually enrolled in our study and have had quite a positive experience uh, and also a collaboration with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So the general design is to simply take a group of cadets and keto adapt them for 12 weeks. Uh, we're doing that by providing food for them and also training them. So they come train with us for the 12 weeks uh, as well and then we have a pretty extensive battery of tests before and after. And it's quite an impressive operation we have for doing feeding studies. Uh, we have three large feeding studies going on now at OSU. Taryn Sapper and Anna Woodruff really manage the, the kitchen as well as other, um, other tasks uh, related to these projects. Uh, we're preparing hundreds of meals sometimes in a day for various participants in our research projects. So these are very well controlled studies. Uh, in the tank study, we're actually measuring ketones daily in the morning and use that as biofeedback to personalize the diet. And in the four or five participants that have completed our study, their average beta hydroxybutyrate level is 1.4 millimolar. So the training, uh, we're, we're supervising the training two times a week, plus they do their normal physical um, training for the Army. Uh, so it's focused on strength and power more than endurance, but it is a kind of a mixed modality uh, type training. We're doing a whole range of um, tests at baseline, including muscle biopsies, and Dr. Arnold is our resident expert in doing muscle biopsies. He's also a recent convert to the ketogenic diet. We convinced him to, to adopt our diet, and he cannot stop talking about how much it's done to his general well-being and he's quite an avid endurance athlete too and it's been transformative for him uh, so um, another uh, convert let's say we're doing dexas and resting metabolic rates um, also some really advanced testing with um, mri looking at ectopic fat accumulation as well as some uh, advanced measures of structure and function of cardiac um, uh, morphology and so uh, that's um, all being done in a specialized MRI where we have a treadmill that's coupled with it and we actually look at heart functioning immediately after exercise on a treadmill. And we're also looking at cognitive function. This is a, a really a wide open area but super important for military uh, personnel who need to make important decisions and often under stress. So we're, we're looking at um, a variety of different cognitive tests um, under the stress of exercise. And hopefully we'll be integrating soon um, some really you know, specific tasks for soldiers. So we have a shoot house that we're incorporating into our lab where we can look at you know, accuracy and precision of shooting uh, while being keto adapted. We have a casualty drag, which is, again, you know, more on the military-specific task and physical performance. Uh, and I'll just share with very quickly some data with you. Uh, very preliminary here, so I'll emphasize that. We have completed uh, actually five or six people now, but we have four tabulated. And you can see these cadets um, lost weight, lost a lot of body fat. In fact, every one of these four uh, participants lost a significant amount of fat mass and their strength's gone up. And you're gonna hear more about that with the next talk with Dr. Wilson. 
that clearly a keto adaptation doesn't compromise strength gains, may actually optimize them in some cases, but clearly losing fat and getting stronger is not a bad thing for most athletes or soldiers. So uh, Rich uh, LaFountain has a uh, poster as well that um, you want to learn more about that. Uh, he'll be presenting this evening. So in summary, uh, keto adaptation appears to be quite effective in optimizing performance in endurance athletes and maybe even some strength and power athletes and clearly certain professions uh, like soldiers where there's a, a big demand on physical and cognitive performance. And I won't go through all these lists, but there's a lot of reasons why keto adaptation may work in athletes, not just because they can burn more fat. Again, it's this pleiotropic effects of ketosis that really give this resiliency to athletes to be able to recover faster. So I'll stop there and, and uh, if there's time for questions, I'll do that or we can go straight to the next talk. Okay. <laughs>